The purpose of this episode is to explore common health and well-being issues for people with Down syndrome. This content is not intended as a substitute for direct medical care by relevant professionals. Rather, we hope to share new and important information so families and supporters can be well-informed when accessing medical care. Your individual's medical or educational professionals may have recommended different practices or procedures that are specific to them. Do not modify or change your individual's treatment or therapy plan without consulting with your care provider. Today on The Lowdown, a Down Syndrome podcast. Dr. Megan O'Neill and Nicole Balmer gives us the lowdown on epilepsy and Down syndrome. Over to you, Hannah Mala. Thanks, Danielle. Hello and welcome to the Lowdown Podcast. I'm Hannah and with me here is my co-host, Marla. Hi, Marla. How's it going? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good, good. Um, so on today's episode, we will be diving into the medical side of Down syndrome and discussing seizures and seizure disorders. We aim to provide you with the background information, clarify some terminology, and discuss treatment and interventions. Of course, there's a big disclaimer here that please do discuss anything that we talk about today with your own primary care physician um, before taking any further steps in your child's or loved one care. We are very fortunate to have two guests join us today, both experts in the field of neurology and neurodevelopmental disabilities. First, we have Dr. Megan O'Neill. She is um, a child neurologist and neurodevelopmental disability specialist at Lori Children's Hospital in Chicago. She is also an assistant professor of pediatrics at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. O'Neill is the founder and director of the Lori Children's Down Syndrome Clinic, which focuses on evaluation and management of neurodevelopmental, behavioral, and medical concerns among children with Down syndrome from the greater Chicago area. Her research also focuses on neurodevelopment in Down syndrome. And our other guest today is Dr. Nicole Balmer. She's also a child neurologist and neurodevelopmental disability specialist at Boston Children's Hospital and an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Balmer is the director of the Boston Children's Hospital Down Syndrome Program, and she specializes in clinical care of children with Down syndrome, autism, ADHD, and other neurodevelopmental and behavioral disorders. Her research is focused on neurodevelopment in Down syndrome and on interventions to optimize health, learning, and development. Welcome to both of you. Welcome to the lowdown. It's great to have you here. Hi, great thanks. To it's be great here. to be here. Uh, in the grand tradition of our little podcast here, we'll start off with some secret questions um, so that the audience can get to know you guys a little bit better. So question number one is for you, Dr. O'Neill. What are you reading or listening to right now that you're enjoying? Um, I mostly listen to some audiobooks, and I also, this is, I started reading a book recently with my um, third grade daughter. It's called Pax, and it's about a little boy with a fox. <laughs> That's oh. probably the most uh, interesting thing I've been reading recently, sadly. <laughs> That's awesome. It sounds charming, though. It sounds yeah. lovely. <laughs> it's a cute book. <laughs> oh. And um, Dr. Bomber, what is your favorite snowy weather activity? Skiing. You get plenty of snow Downhill in Boston. Skiing. Yes, we do get plenty of snow here in Boston. However, it is not my favorite place to ski. I, I prefer oh. to, to ski elsewhere, but downhill skiing is my favorite winter sport. Ah, well, you, if you love skiing, you definitely have to, I don't know if you've been to Vancouver before, but Whistler would be your ideal um, location to do some of that stuff too. Yes, it's a yeah. dream spot. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll take over for the next couple of questions. Um, all right, we have some really kind of silly, funny questions in here. So get ready for this one. Dr. O'Neill, what is the best kind of cake? Ooh, chocolate. I just go with yeah. basic chocolate yeah. cake. Classic. I don't like any frills. Yep. No just frills. The chocolate. And I, <laughs> no frills. I, I also like Dairy Queen ice cream cake. Oh, I don't yeah. know. Middle part? Um, yeah. All of it, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, such a good classic. I agree. Um Dr. Bomber, do you have a de-stress routine? How do you kind of unwind at the end of a busy day? 
I like to do yoga. I actually usually start my day with yoga and then the end of the day, I don't know. I think I just become exhausted and finally just go to sleep without a routine. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Dr. Neil, I was interested in, in your answer for this one too. How do you unwind after a really long, busy day? Um, yeah, passing out. I don't, yeah. <laughs> I have, I have, uh, I have four little kids, so, um, I really just try to survive the evening. And then, um, I will say my husband and I usually wind down by watching a myriad of like yeah. shows on TV. We're watching, um, only murders in the building most yes. recently, but that's yeah. our, our de-stressing routine, I guess, if you would call it that. Right. Love it. <laughs> Yeah, I would de-stress with Martin Short and Steve Martin. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> I agree. I love that show. Um, okay, and then last question for both of you, I guess. Um, are you morning people or night owls? I am a night owl. Yeah. I will stay up to like one or two naturally. Yeah. Um, and so waking up in the morning, not my favorite thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Barber, I, how about you? I, I think I'm both. Yeah. I start really early and end really late. I think I just function on less sleep in general. Yeah, I feel like you and I are the same with that with that respect too. I'm always super early. Uh, well, thank you so much for indulging us in that. It's kind of nice to get to know you as people as well. Um, but let's start to kind of talk about our topic at hand. Um, Dr. Weber, how about I start with you? Um, let's start at the beginning. So for our um, listeners who may not be familiar, can you describe um, what is a seizure and what is epilepsy? Sure. Yes. Terminology is important. So a seizure is, it's really a sudden burst of electrical activity that happens in the brain that can cause abnormal movements or behavior or a certain feeling in the body. And it's due to abnormal firing of nerve cells in the brain. And ep epilepsy is the term we use when we're describing repeated unprovoked seizure and a propensity for seizures that are due to these abnormal electrical signals in the brain. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about like the different kinds of seizures and is it possible to have like a combined seizure type? Yes. So there are many different kinds of seizures and, and actually infantile spasms is one of the most common types of seizures that can occur in babies with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and the different kind of seizures can involve part of the brain or the whole brain. And sometimes one seizure type may evolve into another seizure type or there may be certain epilepsy syndromes that involve several different types of seizures. So mm -hmm. I think when people often think about seizures, they think about the big kind of seizure where people yeah. will either stiffen or shake their bodies, but that's really just one type. There's also seizures that can be a uh, sensory feeling or seizures that can be, um, you know, just one part of the body moving. So various mm -hmm. different types and combinations. And we know that people with Down syndrome can have any different type of seizure, mm -hmm. any kind of seizure that we know about has been reported in people with Down syndrome, but there are certain seizures that are more common, infantile spasms being one of the most mm -hmm. common. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to clarify just like right from the get-go that um, seizures are not always as obvious as what I think of as a TV seizure, which is something that probably most people have seen somewhere on TV um, where the person falls all the way to the floor and loses consciousness and there's lots of convulsing. Um, so some of what we're talking about here looks a lot more subtle than that. Um, I think that's an important point to, to yes, that's bring exactly up from right. the beginning. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they're very subtle and can be very hard to detect. Sometimes they just uh, are blank staring. So mm -hmm. so definitely um, it's the big ones that you've described, what you described as the sort of TV seizures that definitely people have in their mind as what a seizure looks like, but there's many other types as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so why are people with Down syndrome more at risk for seizures or for having epilepsy? I mean, I think the prevalence is about 22% of people with Down syndrome compared to, you know, up to like 39% of people with autism and just 1.2% of the overall population. So can you talk a little bit about the prevalence um, in the Down syndrome population? Sure, Megan, you want to take that one? Um, yeah, you know, I think when we look at uh, prevalence of seizures and Down syndrome, they do seem to be definitely more common than what we see in the general population. When you compare it to other forms of intellectual disability, they might be less common, 
Um, but I think there's several reasons for um, this like increased risk in um, seizure activity. And it mm -hmm. kind of goes back to how um, the extra chromosome that we see with trisomy 21 impacts brain development. So there's differences in the way that nerve cells connect and talk to each other. There's differences in the structure of the brain and how the brain um, forms in like er the early developmental period. Um, and there's, uh, you know, a lot of this, uh, th there's genetic factors that impact the way membranes um, in, the br in the brain, like membrane channels function. And so I think there's a lot of different risk factors, but for any given individual, sometimes it's hard to know exactly why that person um, may have an increased risk of seizures. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other factor that can sometimes play in is um, there can be uh, an increased risk for acquired injuries. So people with Down syndrome have higher rates of things like congenital heart disease, mm -hmm. moya moya. Um, more of a risk for infection, and those things can lead to um, damage to the brain or injury to the brain. And we know that if the brain is injured, uh, there can be an increased risk for seizure. Um, there's also some interesting like research into infantile spasms and things like that. Um, there's a particular gene that is triplicated um, that may cause uh, an increased propensity for uh, infantile spasms. Mm -hmm. So that's being looked at as a possible um, target for medication. But I still, you know, we're still a ways away from like fully understanding all of this when it comes to Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I think, you know, it, that I don't personally treat a lot because I don't see adults with Down syndrome. I see only children. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that uh, there's this condition called low meds. Um, which is late onset myoclonic um, epilepsy associated uh, with Down syndrome, but it's, it goes hand in hand with Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And so this is related to um, the increase of um, amyloid and tau proteins that sort of accumulate in the brain and alter the way that the brain is, the electrical activity um, happens in the brain and that can lead to these uh, very mm -hmm. characteristic seizures associated with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, I don't personally treat that um, because yeah. I don't see adults, but that's another um, kind of like separate seizure disorder that is more frequent in people with Down syndrome because of the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. um, pathology mm -hmm. that we see. Yeah. Outside, uh, I have questions about this. Outside yeah. of the population of Down syndrome, so for other elderly people who have dementia, are they also at risk of the same sort of seizure onset? Or is it assumed to be a higher incidence for people with Down syndrome because of the initial risk factors? Or the ongoing risk factors? Yeah, I think that we, again, I don't treat many adults um, in general, but I think that we we do tend to see uh, an association of seizures with dementia, but mm -hmm. it seems to be uniquely higher in the Down syndrome population. And that's where this whole like low meds thing um, came from. It, it's, it, it's its own terminology, like specific to Down syndrome, right. and it seems to be um, much more common. And that and that probably is related to the fact that all, uh, you know, individuals with Down syndrome have this underlying like b brain pathology that's yeah. very yeah. Un unique to their um, biology and, and mm -hmm. genetics. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there's that triplication of the gene that you were talking about earlier too, right? Which is, yeah, kind of contributing to it. Um, Dr. Neil, can you tell us a little bit about how seizure disorders are diagnosed? Yeah, so I think that um, that's probably the the yeah that's the most important like starting point, and it and it begins with uh, really getting like a careful history from a physician standpoint, like really getting a sense of what exactly happened, um, if at all possible. I think seeing a video or actually being able to see the movement sometimes mm -hmm. um, is you know, that can speak more than than sometimes any uh, words themselves can tell you in terms of what's going on. But I think really getting a sense of like what happened with the event, getting a description and um, getting a sense of what exactly was going on. Sometimes, though, like even just with a description or sometimes even viewing a video, mm 
it's not exactly clear what's going on. And mm -hmm. so we all often also um, use EEG data and EEG stands for electroencephalography, I can't speak. Um, and this is a test that looks at um, abnormal patterns of electrical activity in the brain. So um, uh, an EEG tech will uh, put electrodes or sensors that attach to the scalp and and then we're able to like attach that to a fancy machine that analyzes brainwave patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and then a specific neurologist who's trained in reading those EEGs will look at that and kind of um, compare to what we expect to see and, and look for um, abnormal patterns of electrical firing, actual seizures, or things um, that indicate that the brain is at a higher risk to have abnormal activity or, mm -hmm. or seizure activity. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we'll do like a short EEG uh, to get a sense of whether there's like irritability of the brain. Um, and that in conjunction with what the event um, looked like or sounded like is enough to, to convince us that this was most likely a seizure. Likely, yeah, yeah. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's really not, even with that, it's not clear. And so occasionally um, we will send people to like an, uh, an epilepsy monitoring unit where they will be t uh, attached to a continuous EEG machine, sometimes for several days um, to try mm -hmm. to actually capture an episode mm -hmm. to see if that's really, if it really was a seizure or if it was some other kind of movement that wasn't associated with abnormal electrical mm -hmm. activity. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not always perfectly Clear. obvious. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. It, it requires um, a lot of thought and and sometimes a lot of work up. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the last thing that we sometimes do also is get a picture of the brain or an MRI mm -hmm. um, to look at the structure of the brain um, and see if there's anything uh, like anything with the structure of the brain that would indicate that this area is more likely to um, cause a seizure or that like a seizure would mm -hmm. come from a particular area. Mm -hmm. But that that on its own is not like diagnostic of a seizure. It's really those other um, aspects that other aspects. are more important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were saying earlier that, you know, um, to kind of record or look for these, like apart from the actual seizure activity and what it manifests, like, are there other things that might happen before a seizure or after seizure that could indicate that a child or someone is having a seizure? Like a lot of the times they'll become very tired after, or they might fall asleep. So just curious, like, what are some of the other signs that parents and caregivers should look out for, for something like that? Yeah, so so some individuals um, will have like an aura before they um, go on to have a seizure. It, it kind of depends on what the seizure type is and, and okay. the larger picture. Um, I will say I don't have many patients with Down syndrome who actually like verbalize that. But I yeah. do think I have I have um, several patients where I think their parents are able to sort of get a sense like something mm -hmm. just seems off. Their, their child seems like they're just acting a little bit different. Um, and then I think some people also have clear triggers. Like I have some patients who, if they get a poor night's sleep yeah. or they're ill, their parents are really keeping a close eye out for them to have, like potentially have a seizure because those are known triggers. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you mentioned, many people uh, who have seizure disorders have what we call like a post-ictal period where mm -hmm after the seizure and it, again it kind of depends on what the seizure type is yeah. um, but where after the seizure they will be sleepy drowsy just not quite acting right mm -hmm. um, and and may take um, you know minutes to hours to get back to their um, normal baseline yeah. and that you know if I hear a story like that in association with uh, an, an Another, odd yeah. event or a weird movement that would mm -hmm. definitely make me um, pause and be more concerned for mm -hmm. something like a seizure. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about infantile spasms, which have a really particular look um, and with regards to what things parents should be keeping an eye out for? Yeah, Either I think that's, a, that's that. a great question. Mm -hmm. I think that it's really helpful to talk specifically about infantile spasms. And I, I don't know about you, Megan, but I feel that that's one of the 
epilepsy syndromes that's most commonly overlooked in people with Down syndrome. And there can often be a delay in the diagnosis because it can be so subtle. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think about what infantile spasms looks like, it can be a really subtle, almost like exaggerated startle reflex with this Mm -hmm. flexing and tensing and bending of the trunk and Sometimes it occurs in clusters, so you see a bunch of those in a row, and it can be around sleep-wake transitions or around feeding times, and so it can be a little bit subtle and might just look behavioral or might look like something else, and so it's really important to have a higher alert for looking at those specific types of seizures. And, you know, as Megan said before, having a video can be very, very helpful because there are some other things that can look just like an infantile spasm. Um, One of the things that really tends to be a clue for us is whenever those kinds of movements are associated with developmental delay or changes, or maybe a child stops achieving milestones or was doing a skill that they're no longer doing or used to be Mm -hmm. socially interactive and then stops and be is a little bit more withdrawn so whenever we hear movements plus any of those developmental concerns that's especially concerning for infantile Mm -hmm. spasms Mm -hmm. and correct me if i'm wrong but i believe there's a there's a movement where the knees are coming up to the chest that kind of really small movement that looks like pretty much what every baby does um right and (laughs) you know, people say, oh, gassy baby or whatever. Like it's very easy to dismiss those kinds of things. And yet infantile spasms is considered in a medical emergency that should be treated immediately. So this is, it, I think it puts parents at unease uh, because they're like, well, how are we going to know? Um, so taking a video is a good place to start. It sounds like. Yes, that's always very helpful. And and you're right. And so some people use the term sort of jackknife seizure with this very sudden movement of the body almost sort of like collapsing a little bit mm-hmm. on itself. But I think that, you know, the truth of the matter is that babies make lots of funny movements and yes. they're doing funny movements all the time. And so it's really difficult to tease it apart um, when there's a re- a repetitive pattern to this, and these are occurring in in clusters, and there's distress in in the baby's face. Those are all pieces that we would look for in a video to make us, you know, be more or less concerned about infantile spasms. The truth of the matter is that even the best neurologists sometimes can't tell by looking at a mm-hmm. video, and so we have a really low threshold for being suspicious and referring for an EEG, which will be very helpful in determining whether or not the movements are or are not seizures. Yeah. And I think this kind of ties in perfectly with the next question, which is, you know, often people will interchange or confuse terms like spasms and seizures with other movements. So um, what are some other considerations for non-typical motor movements? So I I know Marla kind of um, referred to like some of the digestive irritability or starter reflexes. I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about those. Dr. Neal, perhaps? Yeah. 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 So there are as as um, Dr. Balmer mentioned, there are a lot of movements, especially in babies, that can be very confusing. Um, I would say kind of the top things that tend to, that I tend to see that, um, you know, we think about spasms that end up maybe not being in that, in that category um, would be uh, the digestive irritability, colic, reflux, that kind of stuff leading to back arching and mm-hmm. some odd kinds of movements there. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes we can tease that apart by looking at video, seeing if if they the timing of the events happens more around Mm -hmm. feeds or things like that. Um, But again, sometimes you don't know until you really get EEG data to to reassure you. Um, There can be exaggerated startle reflexes. We expect there's something called a moral reflex, which is a normal neonatal reflex Mm -hmm. that goes away around four to six months of age. Um, But it 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 does look different than infantile spasms, but it can be very confusing for parents. Um, you know, if we were to see something like that in like a nine month old, you know, that that would be less expected and we would be uh, perhaps more concerned about infantile spasms. Um, I, shuddering attacks and stereotypic movements are other like really funny looking baby movements that are often um, confused with infantile spasms. Um, shuddering especially tends to look sort of like a shivering movement or like Mm -hmm. straining. Um, 
But usually kids with those don't have any kind of like change in their consciousness or, or distress necessarily. Um, but a lot of times, you know, again, getting an EEG is the, is the way to um, clarify yeah. what's going on. Those tend to resolve um, on their own over time. I think that's mm-hmm. another way uh, to sort of differentiate sometimes um, with, yeah. with infantile spasms they will continue and they'll pick up over time and they'll persist. Whereas some of these other baby movements um, are more um, up and down or just kind of go away or resolve over time. Um, And then I think the last thing, you know, we, we tend to see a lot of funny, like sleep movements, like a little like jerky movements, myoclonus. Um, And so I think again, like trying to get video, trying to get a little bit more of a history and as Dr. Balmer mentioned, really looking at the overall um, other factors like the child's development, the description, is there clustering? Are they increasing over time? Mm-hmm. Is it the right, are we in the right age range? Um, and then I think just to emphasize, defaulting back to EEG information, if there's any sort of shred of, of doubt, yeah, which yeah. Often, oftentimes there, there can mm-hmm. be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Bomber, I want to turn now to you. And I want to speak a little bit about individuals who have a dual diagnosis. Now, this is a bit tricky because often um, people aren't going to get the second diagnosis of autism until much later, even though there might be seizures preceding that second diagnosis. But what can you tell us a little bit about that increased risk of epilepsy or seizure events when there is a dual diagnosis and what's known right now is are we thinking causal relationship or is it just a correlation um i'm curious to hear your thoughts on that yeah so that's a really great and complex question sorry Um, no you're right there there's multiple different directions that this can go we know that there is a relationship between epilepsy and development. And we know that, for example, even not in the Down syndrome population, if you just think about children who have a diagnosis of autism, there is a higher risk of epilepsy in that group, probably like 10 to 30% or so of people with autism also have epilepsy. Infantile spasms is this more interesting relationship and has been associated with a subsequent diagnosis of autism or intellectual disability. And of course, people with Down syndrome are both at risk for autism and they are at risk for epilepsy or infantile spasms. Of the population of people with Down syndrome and autism, we have done some research to try to understand what the impact of epilepsy is there or whether there's an increased risk of epilepsy. And when we compared children who had a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism compared to just Down syndrome, there was a much higher odds of having epilepsy and especially infantile spasms in that population Mm -hmm. of children with Down syndrome and autism. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's causal. Um, You know, it's it's hard to know is the same person predisposed to both Mm -hmm. infantile spasms or epilepsy as well as autism. Or is there an impact of the infantile spasms that affects development and increases the risk of autism? And all of that still is to be worked out. Mm -hmm. It is a a complex tangle. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk to us, Dr. Bummer, a little bit about um, what the role of the primary care physician is in managing epilepsy. Both of you are specialists, so people are coming to see you you know, here and there, or maybe for ongoing support. Um, But what are we expecting of the primary care physician for this situation? Yeah, so I, you know, I think uh, Dr. O'Neill and I probably both have a slightly biased view on this because we work in big specialized centers where Mm -hmm. there are lots of of medical subspecialists. And so in my experience, primary care providers aren't managing epilepsy, but they're often the first place that somebody will go when they mm-hmm. have a concern about their child. And so it's then the primary care provider's responsibility to sort of hear those concerns, get a first history and an exam, and then make the decision of when or if to refer to a neurologist for further evaluation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think specifically for people with Down syndrome, fortunately, there are healthcare supervision guidelines yes. and 
the goal of those guidelines is to support primary care providers who may not see lots and lots and lots of people with Down syndrome within their mm-hmm. their pediatric practices, mm-hmm. but to know what to look for and to know what things may be more prevalent in the population so that they can have you know, a, a higher level of suspicion. And one of the things that we've really done lately and one of the changes from prior iterations of the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines was to put more emphasis both on the developmental concerns as well as the possibility of seizures and infantile spasms specifically. So mm-hmm. the guidelines are that people should really be looking for mm-hmm. any neurologic concerns. Mm-hmm. And we really try in our practices to provide anticipatory guidance about the possibility, especially of infantile spasms, because it can be so subtle. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, one of the things that would be great if, if pediatricians could help would be to sort of do that first line of trying to get videos from the families, pass those along and partner with us to really figure out how urgent something is. Like, as you mentioned before, certainly something like infantile spasms is a medical emergency. And so we can sort of partner and say, yes, we're really concerned about this straight to the emergency room or straight to an EEG versus, Mm -hmm. you know, yes, this looks like it could be something. We'd be happy to see them in the neurology office in the next few weeks or something like that. So I think it's part of that triage, part of that hearing family concerns and having connections with the neurologist that can help with that decision making. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like overall maintaining a really low threshold for referral um, just because the risk factors are known to be very high in this mm-hmm. group. Yes. Um, Dr. O'Neill, can you talk to us a little bit about what happens after a child starts medication? So we're, we're, you know, we have a child, they present and emerge, they say yes, infantile spasms. And then in, basically immediately you're starting some medications to reduce that seizure activity. So what does that look like for a family? Yeah. And, and I will say, um, Treatment of infantile spasms is a little bit unique relative to other um, forms of seizure disorders. When mm-hmm. it comes to infantile spasms, um, in my institution, usually that involves admission to the hospital to start a hormonal treatment um, called ACTH. Mm-hmm. Um, some uh, institutions also um, use steroids or other sort of related um, medications in the initial treatment of infantile spasms. Um, And infantile spasms is one area where sometimes like all we need is an initial couple months of treatment and that leads to full resolution of the spasms. And then from there on out, um, sometimes uh, additional anti-seizure medications are no longer needed. Mm -hmm. Um, There is some data in Down syndrome that shows that people uh, people with Down syndrome and infantile spasms may have a lower risk of subsequent epilepsy down the road compared to what we call like idiopathic infantile spasms. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, you know, that that may mean that the long term prospects for needing anti seizure medications may be lower. But we don't know. It all depends on the individual circumstance. Mm -hmm. Um, There are sometimes other treatments that are used if infantile spasms don't respond initially. And that may include um, other anti-seizure medication options and sometimes the ketogenic diet, Mm -hmm. um, which can be very effective. When we're looking at older kids or adults who have seizures, um, the treatment there is a little bit different sometimes. Um, A lot of times that uh, that will entail being on an anti-seizure medication on a daily basis that's used to prevent seizure reoccurrence. And I think, you know, the goal for all patients with seizures is to be completely free of seizures, to have, you know, complete yeah. control. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, in that, in, in those populations, we also talk about um, seizure rescue medications. So, yeah. Uh, anti-seizure medications are used to prevent seizures, but if they happen, um, they aren't, those medications aren't going to stop the seizure in it, in, in the moment. So we will often prescribe seizure rescue medications that are used to terminate seizures that are lasting longer than five minutes. Um, mm-hmm. and that's because there's a lot of research that shows that seizures that are lasting past the four to five minute mark are less likely to stop on their own. And those are the seizures that put people at risk for injury to the brain. Um, And that's where we're getting into like, you know, very worrisome um, emergency territory. Mm -hmm. So, 
for those older populations, um, we we treat seizures just like we would in the in the general population, but that will entail both a daily anti-seizure medication and always making sure um, that the that the family um, or school has a seizure rescue medication on board and that they have a plan in place. Uh, like an emergency plan for what mm-hmm. to do if a seizure occurs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, length of treatment, how how long a person has to be on a preventative anti-seizure medication really depends on the specific circumstances, um, how long they've been seizure-free, what their brain imaging and EEG patterns look like, um, and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's kind of different, uh, it, a lot of it depends on, um, what the seizure is, and and that really leads us to a, a specific management plan. Mm-hmm. Is is it likely for infantile spasms aside? Um, so for other seizure sort of syndromes, um, is it likely that a single medication continues to work, or is it more likely that there will be medication changes as the sort of types of seizures continue to evolve? <laughs> Yeah, so so for some people, they have really like intractable seizures. They have multiple seizure types and more sort of complex um, seizure disorders that tend to be more disabling and more functionally impairing. And those individuals often require multiple medications. That's where we're often considering the ketogenic diet or other supplementary um, measures, sometimes even like surgical procedures and things like Mm -hmm. that. Um, But there are also uh, many individuals that have, you know, one singular seizure type that are fairly well controlled with the use of a a single medication. Um, And so again, it kind of goes back to the larger picture of of what their particular seizure disorder is. Um, I think you know, in, in individuals who have a history of infantile spasms and then go on to have intractable seizures who also tend to have more complex neurodevelopmental mm-hmm. um, challenges, those tend to be the individuals in my experience that that end up requiring more medications, um, have a more complex management plan, and are often, um, at least in my institution, managed by our epilepsy colleagues, where that's that's all they do is is work mm-hmm. with families who have really complicated uh, or, or patients and families where there's really complicated seizure disorders um, mm-hmm. at play. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Bomber, I'm wondering if you could talk to us about the sort of the necessity of taking seizure me- seizure medications. You know, the, they have a very clear purpose um, in protecting the brain, but they also can have downstream effects on learning and communication. I'm over here as the SLP, um, watching how these things kind of play out. And I would was wondering if you could comment a little bit about how that works. Yes. And I think this is also one of those areas where we don't completely understand the mechanism and the cause and effect and what comes first and what is a consequence. Mm-hmm. We know that there's a relationship between epilepsy and overall developmental cognitive and behavioral functioning. And we know that having lots of uncontrolled seizures is not good for brain development and not mm-hmm. good for learning and all of the cognitive functionings that you're, that you're speaking about. Um, but the direct relationship with how one thing leads to another, we don't really understand. So we think it's very important to control seizures. Infantile spasms is one where the neurodevelopmental um, aftermath of having infantile spasm has has been well characterized, but is still more complicated in people with Down syndrome um, because it's really hard to understand what the impact of infantile spasms might be in somebody who otherwise has differences in their development as a result of the underlying genetic condition. So I think that there's still a lot to learn there, but as an overarching sort of all comers, we know that uncontrolled epilepsy is not good for brain development. Mm -hmm. And so trying to minimize seizures and prevent seizures is really a major goal of our treatment Mm -hmm. for those reasons. Um, I would love to hear thoughts on respite support for families when epilepsy is on board. I mean, I think it's really important to acknowledge that this is a highly stressful situation for families and 
that respite is an essential piece of the of the bigger picture. Yeah, I think respite is, I, I think you're spot on with that. Respite is really important for families, especially where there's, um, you know, very complex uh, epilepsy syndromes. There's, you know, seizures that are hard to control and are, are impacting everyday functioning and requiring a lot of um, caregiving mm-hmm. um, from family members. I think the challenges I tend to see in my community are kind of twofold. A, um, having insurance coverage and like managing the financial aspect, but then B, and, and this is the bigger thing I see is just finding caregivers 100%. and providers out there who have the expertise and the comfort level with managing this stuff. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there are, I think it, it, this is very community dependent, at least in my experience. Um, I was previously in Maryland. Now I'm in the Illinois area. And I think I've, I've seen big differences just in, in all aspects of resources. But I think looking at, um, you know, there's a lot of times there's specific agencies that will provide services, sometimes different hospital networks mm-hmm. will have um, uh, respite programs that they do. Um, in some ways, you know, I think school is is a respite opportunity for um, mm-hmm. for some families. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I, you know, I, I think it's also good to try to recruit uh, informal uh, sources of respite care, like family members and friends that are trusted. Yeah. Um, you know, there are uh, some pretty good uh, programs out there for training individuals in terms of uh, how to respond to seizures, uh, understanding like emergency action plans and things like that. The Epilepsy Foundation um, actually has several like online webinars. They have a school nurse training program. They have a caregiver training program. So I think there's more and more just even in the last few years um, out there in terms of uh, education to try to help caregivers feel more comfortable with uh, management of uh, complex seizure disorders. Um, so, you know, uh, but I think at the end of the day, it, it's really tricky uh, sometimes for families to locate those services. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think working one-on-one with a provider who has um, some familiarity with what's in the community can be really helpful. Helpful, um, yeah. But, yeah. but completely agree that <laughs> respite is, is something that a lot of these families um really need to, need, to remember yeah. so that they can take time to recharge and take care of themselves as yeah. well. And I, I think it like in, sorry, go ahead, Marla. Oh, I was just going to say, this is a good time to mention that little gem from Dr. Spinazzi from a few seasons ago, that within the United States, there's a, the little known um, case manager role from insurance companies who would be able to help um, look out for people and help somebody navigate what's available through their insurance um, so that's something to look for if you're in the States. Sorry, and I was, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, Dr. Neal, it's interesting because with a few of our families that we talk to about respite for 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 themselves and for their kids, um, I think one of their biggest concerns is that it is such a complex picture and they're like, you know what, I know exactly what yeah. my child will need at what time. And I think just the idea of training somebody else can be so daunting. So I'm so happy that you mentioned that there are webinars and programs and, you know, other agencies that can maybe help do that training with you so that, you know, because again, on a, on an already very full plate, this is just another thing that they don't have room to add. So it's, it's good to know that there are other resources out there um, for families as well. Um, And you had mentioned just a, a few minutes ago about managing seizures in schools. And you talked about, you know, having a seizure plan and seizure rescue medications on board. Um, would specialists like yourselves be good, would be like the point people to come up with a seizure plan for school? Or like, how would you ask families to navigate kind of that piece? Yeah, in the, um, I'm not sure about uh, how Dr. Bomber does this, but in the state of Illinois, we fill out like seizure action plans for okay. all children who are in school and have epilepsy so that the school knows exactly like what medications they take, how to respond, what to do, when to give what medication, when to call 911. Um, And also actually in the, in the state of Illinois, there was uh, an act that was passed in 2020 that requires all school personnel to have training in seizure response, uh, like seizure emergency responses so that 
um, you know, there's, uh, I think, widespread, at least like basic knowledge of what to do yeah. in the case of a, of a seizure. But I'm not sure, um, you know, I'm very <laughs> familiar with local practices. I don't know um, what Dr. Bomber's experience with that is. We have a very similar system where we are frequently providing seizure action plans and direct instructions that families bring to the schools, um, especially on seizure first aid and, you know, what somebody's different response needs would be in the mm -hmm. setting of a seizure. Some of that is dependent on the type of seizure that they have and various things like that. But there's other ways to partner with the, partner with the schools. And I think um, one of the resources that Dr. O'Neill mentioned, the Epilepsy Foundation has really great training, really great guides, really great materials and posters that have seizure first aid information. So I think that's also really helpful. But we are the ones who are typically creating the plan with families that they then mm -hmm. disseminate with, yeah. their, mm -hmm. um, yeah. with their schools, with their camps, with all of the various places that their child will go. Well, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Um, so kind of before we end this episode, I wanted to take a slight turn. We're in the neurology world still, but I was very interested um, in this topic that you both talked about in previous presentations. Um, could we quickly just touch on the topic of ticks versus stereotypies? Um, can you tell us a little bit about the definition of each term and how we can distinguish the two? Because those are also some terms that can be used interchangeably and confused. Sure. Yeah. So ticks are involuntary movements, sounds, and sometimes like sounds and words. Sometimes they can also be verbal. Um, and they're sudden, they're rapid, they're recurrent, and they're non-rhythmic. And we often see them more in, like emerging more in school-age children. Um, and I will say, you know, ticks tend to be a little bit more like random and unpredictable. Uh, when we look at stereotypies, those tend to emerge a little bit earlier. Like we often see those in the first three years of life. Mm -hmm. These are repetitive and, and kind of like driven motor behaviors that are more rhythmic, they're more prolonged, and they tend to be like more fixed and predictable and, and they look the same. Um, and, uh, you know, so they're, they overlap in some ways, but they're also different. Um, stereotypies also tend to involve more of like the arms and the hands and the whole body, like these bigger movements, mm -hmm. whereas ticks tend to be like facial, upper body, um, and a little bit more um, con contained, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I think it's important to try to like look at ticks versus stereotypies and, and differentiate them is because they really can have differences in terms of their associated conditions and in terms of their treatment like yeah. strategies. Um, ticks tend to kind of, again, they like emerge a little bit later and they tend to track along more with ADHD, um, OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas stereotypies, uh, again, emerge at a younger age they do tend to be, um, you know, I will say we tend to see them more commonly in individuals with Down syndrome um, than the general population. And, the, and on their own, it doesn't always mean that there's other neurodevelopmental concerns, mm -hmm. but we do see them um, more frequently with autism um, spectrum disorder and, and things like that. So I think whenever I see these different um, movements, what I'm always thinking is, what else is going on? Is there something else that I need to look for? Because often it's those other conditions that tend to be more impairing and need um, more, like need, need to be addressed um, even mm -hmm. more than the, like the movement that you see. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that, you know, it ticks, there are some medications that can be somewhat effective in, in decreasing ticks. Whereas stereotypies um, are, are much more like medication resistant. There's not great like medication options mm -hmm. to reduce those, mm -hmm. um, but we can use behavioral strategies and distraction and things like that um, for, for both of them. Uh, the last thing I'll kind of say is I, I sort of see ticks as um, ticks interrupt what's happening. Ticks yeah. are not what the individual wants to be. Um, sort of like engaging in they kind of come out of nowhere yeah I have I have a few patients with ticks that are very distressed by them mm -hmm. um, and and really don't you know again like want to be doing them 
Whereas stereotypies, I think, serve a little bit yeah. more of a, a function for the individual. They tend to be calm. They yeah. tend to be, um, uh, there's something that the individual like is happy uh, to do. And yeah. I don't really worry too much about that unless the person really only wants to engage in the stereotypy and that holding them back from social engagement or mm-hmm. learning or participation in some of the other things that, that we need and want to do um, mm-hmm. in life. Yeah. So, yeah. Or, mm-hmm. yeah. Or if it's hurting them, right? Like, especially yeah. with some, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like if it's a self-injurious mm-hmm. sort of stereotypy, or if it's a tick that could lead, lead to injury, like some yeah. sort of violent head motion or something like that. Yeah. I yeah. think, you know, there's always like individual circumstances where we may be more or less mm-hmm. aggressive and in, in mm-hmm. our treatment approaches, but Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there can be a lot of overlap in some ways in terms mm-hmm. of how ticks and stereotypies look. Um, but this, and this kind of goes back to the same thing with what we were talking about with seizures. Um, I think getting video of the movement yeah. and sending them to someone who is able to sort of distinguish that along with the um, information, like the history of what's happening, mm-hmm. um, that can be really helpful. And I have had, I have had families who have told me their child's having ticks. And then they sent me a video and it turned out to be like a focal seizure um, Mm -hmm. or something much more concerning. So I think, uh, you know, for parents who see these movements, it's always good to bring it up with a provider to try to get video so that we can kind of sort out what's what. But ticks and stereotypies generally are not um, nearly as as concerning as seizures, um, but Mm -hmm. we still want to, to address them and think about like what else could be going on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I really liked what you said about um, the distress of the individual and whether or not they're upset by it. And we should probably distinguish there the distress of the individual and the distress of the family, because there are many families who are not happy about stereotypy, if we're mm-hmm. being really frank. Um, but the child is fine with it. Um, so they're not upset, but the family is upset because it might be loud or it might be um, otherwise distracting or something like that. Um, but when you are looking at an individual, you're watching for that person's level of comfort or distress or calming from those movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, Marla. And that's such a good point. I think, I, I think in general, both of these movements tend to, in some ways, bother parents, um, more than, than the individual themselves. Ticks, um, can, can bother both, but that even there, I think parents tend to be very, um, you know, oh my God, what's going on? Or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, sometimes these behaviors can be distracting, and that is a factor that does play a part in terms of how we approach um, treatment. But I think especially with stereotypies, um, a lot of times I think parent education, talking about what this represents, that it's not a problem, um, like it doesn't represent any kind of like brain damage or like dysfunction yeah. necessarily, what we kind of want to watch for. And then sometimes just working a lot on behavioral strategies, like can we kind of put boundaries around um, the behavior, like it's so, you know, we want to focus on doing it um, in a home or somewhere where maybe it's like less disruptive or first we have to like finish X, Y, Z, and then we can mm-hmm. go, you know, um, like shake the bear or do whatever the, yeah. the stereotype <laughs> shake is. The bear. Um, I love that shake the bear. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we can both and, picture it. We know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I think there, and, and for any indiv- any given individual, sometimes there's very specific strategies that may work and, and other strategies that, that don't work. Um, but I think for a lot of parents, just like having a conversation with it mm-hmm. um, really can kind of, uh, a conversation about what's going on can really change their mindset um, to some degree on, yeah. on how much we really need to, uh, effort we need to, to put into the, yeah. um, you know, working on the behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like oftentimes, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Bummer. No, that's okay. I was, I agree with all of that. And I think that the point that Dr. O'Neill was making around, like, what is a distinguishing feature to help us determine what might be a tick versus a stereotypy, that distress piece can be very helpful. But I think in my experience, you know, both ticks and stereotypies can be interfering or impairing Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. may require intervention in one way or the other. We definitely think of it differently than we think of epilepsy and seizures, which are Mm -hmm. are more sort of require medical treatment for a lot of other reasons and for safety. Um, But even stereotypies, 
they may be serving a self-soothing function for the child, but may be interfering with their learning or their socialization or, or something else. So that they still may be impairing in some way and require intervention. It's just that we sort of think about them a little bit differently. Definitely, so it does get yeah. a little bit complicated when you're thinking about mm-hmm. what's distressing to one person or another person and what's actually dangerous. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. But I think all of those things have to be considered in a conversation with providers is really helpful to sort that all out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I just realized, just like for our listeners, I may not be familiar with the term stereotypy because it is a yeah. slightly more technical term. It's, you know, similar to the terms that are more useful, like stimming, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So so just for people that are wondering, like, I've never heard of this term before. And I'm just going to say that as an OT, I, Dr. Neil, I have those conversations with families about, you know, there is a slight perspective shift with neurodiversity affirming practices that, you know, some stereotypies or stimming is OK. Like it should be moved towards acceptance and then I tried to get the family's perspective I'm like put yourself in their shoes like you we all engage in some form of a stereotypy whether it's biting our nails or you know flicking our leg when we're doing all these kind of things so I I totally agree with you that sometimes just having an open and frank conversation with families about about those things can kind of help shift their perspective a little bit Mm -hmm. yeah Um, and and I always really try to emphasize like how like getting a sense of like how frequent is it how severe Mm -hmm. is it and how much is it impacting function and if the answer to all of those is like you know not not that significant then you know maybe we don't do a whole lot about it but if those things are really problematic as dr bomber mentioned then you know maybe we do want to like focus on this but it's it's not a one-size-fits-all thing and it's a conversation and i think there is some degree of um you know just like normalization of of as you mentioned like we all engage in these behaviors but it's about how does this impact yeah every participation life. yeah 100 yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah wonderful yeah. and if people are wondering they and they don't have access to um neurologists they can also ask their ot hina spends a lot of time helping families understand this and helping families to find functional replacements that meet somebody's sort of sensory regulation needs that would allow them to participate and still be calm and, you know, comfortable. So this is, Hina, you're going to be so busy. Um, this is, <laughs> these are good questions to bring to your OT. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, before we kind of as, uh, end this episode, would you did mention throughout the episode, and we're going to make a note of these and add these to our episode page, but some resources that you would like for our listeners to check out. So I think you said the Epilepsy Foundation. Um, we'll look for some Canadian-specific ones as well, but were there any others that you think are super helpful for our families? Um, that you would like us to include? Um, I think healthychildren.org has some mm, um, that's that's one, the yeah. AAP's um, sort of like parent-friendly website. They have some good yeah. um, basic information, but the Epilepsy Foundation definitely has, I think, some of the strongest resources out there. They have seizure tracking logs, apps that you can download, oh, okay. information for families about like what to look for and observe. They have a 24-7 hotline. And then there's also a lot of local chapters, at least in, in the United States. Um, there's also something called the Infantile Spasms Action Network, and they have a lot of specific information about infantile spasms where they've like sort of nicely, you know, there's like videos yeah. and information about that particular seizure type, because I do think that is kind of its own entity and, and a little yeah. bit more confusing for families. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's some good podcasts out there about mm-hmm. like living life with seizures. Um, there's one called Seizing Life that's through Cure Epilepsy. And I don't know, Dr. Bomber, what other um, things you kind of mentioned to families. I think the families also, especially for Down syndrome specific information, a mm-hmm. lot of the big and national and international Down syndrome advocacy organizations have medical information mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that various experts have written and supported them in, in putting on their websites. And so there's lots of resources that are often available through those websites right. as well. Mm-hmm. Awesome. 
Um, well, thank you both so much. This was so informative. I know I learned a lot more today as well. I'm sure our listeners did. Um, you put hopefully parents' minds at ease, but also on alert a little bit just to kind of, you know, be aware, but also just be more knowledgeable and more empowered to kind of look for these things. So we really would like to thank you both, Dr. Bomber and Dr. O'Neill, for joining us. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Thank, thank you, you so for much. having us.